and we are live. Uh, my name is Rivka Cohen. I'm the program manager at JOFA, the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance. Uh, thank you everyone who's tuning in. I am here with Rabbi Arye Clapper, who is the founder and dean of the Center for Modern Torah Leadership, a member of the Boston Beit Dean and experienced in areas of divorce and conversion, he previously served as Orthodox Advisor and Associate Director for Education at Harvard Hillel, as Talmud Curriculum Chair at Maimonides High School, and as Instructor of Rabbinic Literature and Bioethics at Gan Academy. He is the founder of Midrashat Avigail, a high-level Talmud program for teenage girls, uh, and has published in Tradition, Me'orot, Dina Yisrael, Bay Yitzchak and other journals and has presented at numerous academic and community conferences. He is a popular lecturer who is consulted internationally on issues of Jewish law and whose work is cited regularly in both uh, academic and traditional uh, scholarly works. And we are so fortunate to have him with us here today uh, to talk about a new initiative uh, com combating uh, get abuse. So thank you so much, Rabbi Clapper, for joining us. Thank you. Um, and I want to just start off by asking you to um, tell us a little bit, uh, define the basic terminology. Um, do you mind explaining why? what is a get? What is get refusal and an aguna? Sure. Um, so get is the term we use for uh, what affects the end of a Jewish marriage by divorce. Um, in actuality, it's a, it's a piece of paper um, that is transferred from the husband um, to the wife, and the divorce happens when the wife acquires the piece of paper. Um, it can it requires it has to be given of the free will of the husband and accepted of the free will of the wife. That creates context in which, because in America we have separate, obviously, civil and religious divorce procedures, it creates the context in which people will use a refusal to give or accept to get as a bargaining chip in civil procedures, um, or simply as a mode of expressing spite at, um, at their spouse, or simply because they really are utterly unwilling to give up the marriage, even though the, the marriage has long ended emotionally as a relationship. Um, so there are really three kinds of context in which we're worried. One is we're worried about actually uh, somebody being stuck in a marriage that's long since dead. That's what we call aguna, is a woman who's chained to a marriage which is long, which is long since over. Then there's also actual cases where a party uses refusal of the get to gain uh, something or to try to gain something in the civil procedure. And then there's the unfortunate reality that every get takes place with the specter that somebody will use it uh, as a blackmail procedure. Great, thank you. And can you tell us a bit about the uh, Boston Aguna Task Force that you're part of uh, and the Get Ready Initiative? Sure. So the, the Boston Aguna Task Force, which is a joint project uh, founded by myself, by Dr. Lisa Fishbane Jaffe, who is currently director of the Hadassah Brandeis Institute, and by Mrs. Leah Lipsker, um, is designed to try and make sure that none of these aspects of um, of using of using the get as abuse occur uh, in, initially in the Boston area by working together with the Beit Din and with advocates uh, to provide services and that would uh, intervene early and uh, intervene late and uh, try and make sure that this, this didn't happen. Part of that initiative was creating a website called Get Ready, which served uh, simply as a Q&A, an online Q&A to provide people for information, uh, who need, wanted information about the Get process. And over time that developed, we discovered that there was actually a national and even international need for such a source of information. And that as part of that, that we could not just, we could, we, could do more than provide information, we could actually really get involved in manage cases so that they would not get to the stage of get refusal or to prevent get refusal from being an effective tool in civil negotiations. Um, and out of that, um, we also uh, realized that uh, while the prenuptial agreement is enormously effective for those people who sign it, that so far its reach is limited 
to those people who were married while in the modern Orthodox community, and that we needed something that could help people who had not signed the prenuptial agreement, but were now um, either in the beginning stages or involved already in a civil divorce, and were worried that the Jewish divorce would become an issue in that process. So what are what are some of the um, complications and um, with with the other solutions that you were saying and what how how is this new initiative different and and more helpful for these cases that you're talking about? So the specific thing that uh, we developed a legal document in tandem with a or in cooperation with a, a team of lawyers and a family court judge, and specifically what we're trying to address is an issue of trust that comes up early in the process, comes up during the process, and often exacerbates situations or even creates situations of get refusal where none was initially intended. Our basic premise is that in most cases, certainly outside the New York area, parties go in intending to be completely separated from each other at the end of their divorce procedure. People don't intend to say, oh, we'll get civilly divorced, but I'll still hold you hostage as part of the religious process. If that doesn't make any sense to either party. But what happens is, um, first of all, the, the situation gets um, acrimonious. Um, in the process of divorce, often emotions are, emotions are heightened. People do things to each other and feel the other party has been unfair to them. They feel that the civil process is unfair to them. And they feel entitled to use the religious process either as a compensation as a retaliation for what the other party has done to them or to make up uh, for what they perceive as the injustices done to them by the civil system, or even there's what I call anticipatory aggression. They use it to prevent what they project the other party will do to them. And this particularly happens in the area of the get where somebody says, well, so-and-so is going to withhold the get from me or refuse to accept the get. So I'm going to do X, which doesn't seem right because that way I'll have a, a counter weapon. Um, to, use, to use against them. And then when that happens, the party said, the other party says, well, I never intended to use the get, but now that, they've, now that they've done X to me, well, the only thing I can do is withhold, is withhold the get in response. And so you have a process where the attempt to prevent the use of the get uh, ends up, or the abuse of the get ends up actually generating it. So what we looked for was a way to, first of all, acknowledge that at the outset of the process, it's in both parties' interest to ensure that there will be a get at the end of the process. Because each party is vulnerable to the other party saying, no, I, don't, right, no, I won't accept the get, I won't refuse the get. Um, so at the outset, each party's interest is to assure that the get won't be used by the, won't be used by the other party. Um, so recognizing that and recognizing that the outset of the process, usually both parties intend to give and receive the get. And then finally, one last stage, which is that However, one party often feels that they don't want to be divorced piecemeal. And so they want the civil divorce and the religious divorce to happen together. But since there's no guarantee, the first party will then say, oh, you're only saying that because you intend to use the get as blackmail during the, during the civil process. So our, the idea was to, to create a contract that would be binding civilly um, and enforceable, but, um, by Beitin through the civil courts without generating either constitutional issues or halakhic issues in terms of a coerced get, because as we said, the get has to be given um, of, of the husband's free will. So that's what we did. We spent, um, we spent a year working together as lawyers and we devised a document that um, is currently designed for Massachusetts, but we believe is adaptable um, for most jurisdictions, which enables the parties to sign a contract that ensures that if they reach a civil settlement, um, the get will be part of that civil settlement, and that's built in from the very beginning of the process. Thank you. Do you do you mind sharing a bit more about what kind of halachic complications came up and and how you how you handled them? Sure. So the the um, the fundamental halachic question is that you cannot um, you cannot coerce the husband. Really, under most circumstances, you can't directly coerce the husband at all. There are variants as to what is considered coercion, but it's simpler if you can design the document in a way where there is no coercion on the get per se at all. And that's even worse if the coercion is affected by a civil court 
as opposed to a Beitin. Even if a Beitin rules that certain types of coercion are legitimate, if a civil court enforces those, um, enforces it on the basis of its own interest, as opposed to saying what the um, the Talmud says, "Ase mashi Yisrael Omrim Lecha." If the civil courts enforces a Beitin decree, that's fine, but that's a big problem in America because the civil courts can't really directly enforce a religious decree. Um, so the ideal thing would be to create a document where there is no coercion that is directly linked to the get, and whatever coercion there is is done explicitly as enforcement of a Beitin ruling, as opposed to as a court deciding on its own what it wants to have happen. Um, and I think that's what we've done. And how does how does this document ensure um, that both parties will will keep to the agreement? Is there financial incentive? So what we do is we sign we have the parties sign a binding arbitration agreement at the outset, um, which commits them to go to Beitin and accept and accept Beitin's recommendation as to whether a get is necessary at such point as a civil a civil settlement is needed. And the, the arbitration agreement, like any arbitration agreement, if done properly, is enforceable as is enforceable as an arbitration agreement in civil court. But all the arbitration agreement guarantees is that parties will go to the Beitin. But it also holds the recalcitrant party, a party that doesn't accept the recommendation of the Beitin, liable for all costs of the first party to get the second party, to get the recalcitrant party to go along with the um, with the, the recommendation of the Beitin, which means that the Beitin can call repeated meetings to try and conjole or convince the recalcitrant party into giving the get. And the recalcitrant party is responsible for the costs of the Beitin meeting. And uh, under Massachusetts law, each part, we're required to allow each party to have their lawyer present. So the recalcitrant party will be re responsible for the costs of both lawyers at each subsequent meeting of the Beitin. And so if you figure the costs of two lawyers plus the Beitin meetings, and if the Beitin meets weekly, say, that's actually a very serious expense in maintaining defiance of the Beitin's order. Um, but the court will, the Beitin itself will not order the giving of the get, it will only recommend it. And the civil courts will never say anything related to the get, they'll just comp compel the party to show up to Beitin and pay the costs. Sounds like a clever, clever workaround. Um, do you have any anecdotes of this working so far? So I have two stories I like to tell about this. Um, like all legal documents of this sort, the document works best if it's never tested. Any contract that um, actually goes to court already involves enormous expenses and having your lawyer defend it. So as with the prenup, where the success of the prenup is the absence of cases, as opposed to the outlying cases, um, where it happens, that, that that would be the effectiveness of this as well. So I can tell in the brief time we've had this, uh, two rapid stories. One is a party where, in fact, a case where the divorce had already deteriorated to the point where there were public accusations of get refusal and, um, you know, and parties digging in and rabbis, on, and rabbis on both sides and accusations of all sorts of misbehavior. And on listening, it became clear that what happened was exactly what I call this anticipatory aggression, that one party, right, one party had said, I'll give the get, but only at the civil divorce. And the other party had taken that as a statement, I'm willing to blackmail you um, in, right, um, if you don't, if the civil divorce doesn't go my way, which then generated uh, a whole series of back and forth. And so we said is, you know what, but you can, you can solve this whole problem by signing a document that will in fact commit you to giving a get at the moment, right, if um, at the moment of civil settlement and a divorce that people had said was going to be one of the all-time messy cases that already really had involved rabbis on both sides that spanned state lines uh, was settled a month later with the get because we took the trust issue out of um, tr the trust issue out of the equation. The same case happened um, in a more local case also where um, negotiations couldn't even get started because the parties were unwilling to talk to each other because one party thought that um, as soon as the get was given, the civil the, the, the civil negotiations would end, and they go to you know they go to trial or just refuse to participate. The other party thought that if we ever got a civil settlement, the get would never happen, and there was right, there was no way to bridge that. And so we said, look, there is a way to bridge that. And once there was a way of bridging that, that both parties could be sure that the two would happen together, uh, then again, settlement was um, was reached rapidly. 
That's incredible. That's such an, uh, uh, it's great to have anecdotes of this actually working out very well. Um, how do you think that this will, that this initiative will change the conversation um, around gut refusal? Um, so we think that um, as with the prenup, the, the major effect you're going for is a social change where it just becomes obvious that this is wrong. So our goal is to have this just be a standard part of the outset of, the, of divorce for parties who haven't signed a prenup. The first thing that each party should say to their lawyer is make sure that the get clause is in the agreement from day one. And both parties should say that all negotiations will take place on the premise that the get will be, that the get will be given. And ideally they sign this agreement, which can be signed separately at the very outset of negotiations. Now, I should be clear, it doesn't help if you go to trial. It only commits you to give the get as part of a settlement. But very, very few people enter a divorce process intending to go to trial because trial usually costs more than whatever is at stake. You know, even in cases, I know of a case where there was a million dollars um, at stake, but each party spent more than three quarters of a million dollars, at least in the process of trying to, right, of trying to argue about that. They would have been much better off had it been possible, had it been possible to settle. Um, so our belief is that the vast majority of cases, people go in intending to intending to settle. And therefore, if we can make it um, a communal standard, that when you enter a divorce negotiate, civil divorce negotiation process, each party um, will agree to sign a document which commits them to the civil settlement. And certainly, nobody will ever sign a civil settlement that doesn't include such a clause that guarantees the get um, as, part of the, as part of the civil settlement then um, A, will have eliminated the, the, um, the escalation that often leads to get refusal and will have created a situation where it will be so odd to be the position where you could use the get as a negotiating tool that people will, rec will recognize it as immoral. Great. Do you think that this, will this replace prenups or is this an addition? I think this is an addition. I think the prenups have done a, a spectacular job and um, the prenups work um, even, you know, the threat of going to trial is also, uh, prenups are more effective in, in that regard. We don't, we don't our, our solution doesn't work for people who are prepared to go to trial initially. It doesn't work for people who walk into the divorce process intending to use the get as a, nego as a negotiating tool, um, which anecdotally seems to happen more in certain segments of New York than elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in the United States. Um, so in no way am I um, intending to diminish the, um, the use of prenups. I was in the YUZ Yad and Yad and Kolol when the prenup was first developed and publicized. I, I founded, I was co-founded one of the early organizations designed to promote the uh, prenuptial agreement. It's on the wall of my dining room. If I were in my dining room, I could show you. And for years, um, for years it was there so that when students came to my house, they could say, what's that? And my wife and I could explain um, what it was. And... Um, also, often when I um, go to students' weddings for years, um, my the, the Cuba there, the honor I got was being Masader of the prenup. Uh, that I would I would arrange the prenuptial agreement and I would give a brief explanation of it, usually at the Hassan's Tish. And it was actually my first YouTube video. Is an explanation of the prenuptial agreement at, uh, at one of my at one of my students' weddings. So I'm not in any way diminishing the prenup. I wish the prenup could spread outside modern orthodoxy um, and help uh, diminish the, the scourge of get refusal in the broader community. I don't see that as particularly realistic right now. Uh, and I think that this is a, um, I think that this is a very useful uh, tool for those people who, and who haven't signed it. And also people who didn't grow up in you know, particular communities, people who didn't grow up orthodox often uh, in the Boston area, at least um, people who were married, Non-Orthodox people who are married often want a, often want to receive a get. We think that's a great thing, and unfortunately, because the other party is often really separated from religion, they often see it not as deliberate get refusal, but just I don't want to participate in this. And so we found this very useful for those communities as well. And in those communities right now, there's uh, very little chance as well of uh, signing a halakhically valid prenup. What do you think is the reasoning for for people who just don't want to be part of this. You've you've mentioned a few times that um, people are outside of 
the modern Orthodox community is that mostly your clientele is outside of this community? Um, I mean, again, modern Orthodox community, I think that um, Ora stated recently you know, that get refusal for people within modern Orthodoxy is happily right now appears to be, it's always dangerous to project, but appears to be an, an almost vanishing phenomenon because of the ubiquity of prenups. Um, so people who sign prenuptial agreements rarely need our services because the prenup is effective. Um, so what we're looking for is the right are the people who haven't signed prenups, which includes modern Orthodox people who were married more than 10 years ago. And I was married more than 10 years ago, but at the time I signed the prenup, I was you know maybe the 15th or 20th person. Um, in the in the world it was a big thing. Uh, you know, we announced it under the chuppah, which I think is happening more and more now. But at that point, was a uh, was a big thing. One of my friends had it read under the chuppah, uh, which we wanted. My parents weren't so into. <laughs> um, but I think yes, I think that the you know, the reason to have this done in the modern Orthodox community as well is that it's um, unwise to put all one's eggs in one legal basket. Uh, law, the law about prenuptial agreements changes. In response to social trends, um, you know that there's anti-Sharia sentiment that has um, had real implications in Canada for the validity of prenuptial agreements and prenuptial agreements. Generally, the law on this has changed dramatically over the years. My own contention, which I think the RCA now agrees with, is that the halachic prenup is not legally a prenuptial agreement under American law because it's connected to Jewish marriage and not civil marriage, and therefore it should not be judged under American prenuptial law, and that actually radically enhances its chances of, of long-term effectiveness legally. But you can't be sure that such arguments will work. So for now, you sign the prenup, you're, you know, in God willing, you get, you live, you know, married, happily married for 100 years, and nothing else is ever necessary, because what we're talking about occurs only at the very beginning of a divorce process. Do you see this, um, I think you mentioned that um, it's mostly for Massachusetts right now. Um, do you see it expanding beyond um, the state of Massachusetts soon? Is You said that you think that it's easily adaptable? Everything is adaptable. How easily I would, I wouldn't, I would venture to say. It was an education for me um, to deal with the niceties of secular family law. Um, the same way it was, it was my first experience really with practical halakha was being on a beit din for being the shliach on a beit din for Gittin. And it was very different than the lambdas of the beit midrash. And in the same way in secular law, I have a lot more experience dealing with constitutional law than dealing with the niceties of family law. So easily, I think is, is not fair. What I would say is that we've had lawyers calls from other states and you know, perhaps crudely, we don't know if it'll hold up or not, but they, it, it's useful in negotiate. It's useful just to create the atmosphere between the parties, and probably it would work. And our our plan is to, in the same way that we gathered groups, uh, a group of, of Massachusetts lawyers to put together the Massachusetts document. So we're planning to to um, put together teams of lawyers in other states to adapt it for to adapt it for their specific jurisdictions. You know, focusing initially on states that have high Orthodox populations. Um, and then moving out from there. So we anticipate, if, if we can pull it off, that um, that we'll have sam other sample states um, put put out in the not terribly distant uh, future. People who are interested in engaging in that endeavor are welcome to uh, to contact me. Great. So how do how do people contact you? Is the and is the get ready or get your get website still active? Are you still? Sure questions absolutely you can just contact, contact us through that site or you can contact me directly at modern Torah leadership at gmail.com and um yeah but the the site is is active people should please recommend it to uh, uh to their you know to friends who have, have needed such circumstances and um yeah and i think you know we have myself and Ms. lipsker and uh and um dr and dr fishbane jaffe so we have a team it's not you know and i think it's part of the part of the power of what we've done is that it's not just rabbinic, um, that we're bringing in a legal, you know, legal, legal expert and people with, with connections throughout the, throughout the community um, as well, um, as well. Yeah, I think that's very important. And that's, this is part one of the series and we will be uh, speaking with, with other people that you mentioned to get the different angles of it. Um, one more question is um, within the, 
have there been frequently asked questions um, for the halachic advice that, that people have asked through your website uh, or a particularly interesting question that you can share with us? Uh, um, what I would say is that um, you know, people often ask questions about, are there any circumstances under which I am entitled to use the, to use the get as a weapon? Right? That's a very common uh, question that comes up and has to be delicately negotiated because I think we do have to acknowledge that injustice has happened to people and that it's a challenge to tell people, even though injustice happened to you, the, the, the system will be, right, if we start evaluating that, then the system will be vulnerable to abuse. Um, often, right, I, I don't know that people have to have enormous faith in the civil divorce system, but we have to tell people that the Beitin cannot relitigate every divorce to try and create justice. If you went to a civil system, you have to accept the outcome of that and you can't use a divorce as a weapon. So that's a very, that's a very, um, that's a very common thing. The, the major piece of advice we have to give people over and over again is do not sign a civil agreement unless the get is assured. Um, the worst advice people, and especially women get, is why don't you settle the civil issues now and you'll deal with the get later. Uh, that just leaves yourself, that just leaves you open. And often it's not even just a question of power. It's that the, once you have a civil agreement, then the, the custody relationships are delicate. People don't want to get into fights that damage the other parent, and, right, which is a good thing. You know, they don't want to be in situations where they're, there are constant court orders against the other parent whom they're sharing custody with, where the kids have to see that. So if the get is not done before the civil agreement, it becomes much, much harder um, to, arrange, uh, to arrange one afterwards. The policy of the Boston Baton has always been that we, that we intervene early in the process. And that's why in my experience uh, in Boston, there has not been a case which came to us before the civil divorce where, there wasn't a, where, where a woman wasn't a good afterward. So that's the, the strongest piece of advice we give people is don't sign a civil agreement unless the get is assured. Great. I was going to ask you your final piece of advice and you gave it right there. Uh, do you have anything else to, to add? Um, hmm. I think that probably that, that piece of advice is, uh, is there just, you know, just uh, to tell people that we should be aware that the problem, a large part of the problem is created by lack of adequate information or good advice. And so please make sure that you and your friends um, are getting the right, right, are getting the right information, the right advice, and not to allow a situation to spread because of inadequate information. Great. Thank you so much. And You're welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And everyone who's watching should definitely spread this video around, spread the word. Um, and we look forward to part two. Thank you. Thank you everyone for watching.